Well, good evening, everyone. This is Reverend Barbara Williams, and you have joined us for our positive path for spiritual living this evening. And so um, I've muted everyone. And if there's a point where you would like to submit a question, if you would just do that in your Zoom on your chat or in Facebook, and we will address it at the very end when we stop recording. So if this is your first time with us, I'd love to direct you to our website, and that is unitychq.org. And it's just a combination of Chautauqua, since we're at Chautauqua, which is chq.org, and our unity worldwide, which is unity.org. So this evening, I'd like to get started and introduce you to our minister this week, and this is the Reverend James Stacy. He has been at Chautauqua 12 times, right? He is sitting here beside me. He's going to be on camera in just a moment. And he is also from, from the South, Unity South Twin Cities, and that is in Bloomingfield. Bloomingfield. Bloomington, so yeah, I already got, got that wrong, Bloomington, um, and so we are delighted to have him, and he's going to do something really special. He has probably more background about unity than anyone I've ever experienced, and tonight he's going to work with Mil Mildred Fillmore's, Myrtle Fillmore's um, process of um, math, oh, I have the wrong one. Um, the method of spiritual development. So I'm going to turn that over to him, Reverend James Stacy. Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us at Chautauqua. This is a little new experience uh, for me. And we started it uh, with the Sunday service with people joining us online. Now, the first thing I want to say is a little bit of instruction. I will ask you tonight to just write down some thoughts after a few moments of silence. So please get a uh, pen and paper and have it nearby so that you can participate with this. Um, first of all, I want to thank uh, Barbara and Unity of Chautauqua for inviting me. But Barbara specifically said, um, do what you love, do what you love. And I thought, oh, well, that's got to be unity history. Um, I worked as a business manager for the founding congregation of the Fillmore's in Kansas City uh, for 12 years before going to ministerial school. And I had the privilege of knowing people that had been long alive long enough, they knew Charles and Myrtle Fillmore directly. And they shared so much with me, and I learned so much from them. And I was reminded of the scriptures in the book of Revelation with the letters to the seven communities and the letter to Ephesus, I believe. The Spirit of Christ said, you have forgotten the love you had at first. And I love that phrase. I meditated on it when I was in ministerial school. And a lot of times I have to remember do what you love, do what really matters to you. And so tonight I thought I would present what really matters to me, not because it's the story of Myrtle Fillmore, our mother of unity, the individual whose personal healing and willingness to help others launched our whole global movement. It's not about mimicking Charles or Myrtle Fillmore, but it is about living, experiencing the ideas, the spiritual principles that changed their lives, launched a movement. But it's not enough to repeat their words. We need to repeat their experience. And because we are all children of God, that is always possible for each and every one. So I thought I would begin with a historical note about 1926. Unity had its very popular radio station in Kansas City, WOQ. It was listened to by thousands of people. It even broadcast at night as far away as Nigeria. And that is why study groups formed at that time in Nigeria. 
And that is one of the foreign countries that has the most unity ministers. And I believe last I heard something like 57 unity centers in that country uh, because they heard these ideas, but they didn't mimic Charles. They incorporated them and made them real in their own life. So on radio station WOQ, occasionally, not as often as Charles Fillmore, but occasionally Myrtle Fillmore would go on air and she'd start out by saying, dear friend, I just wanna come into your home, sit down and have a little chat with you. She made it very individual, very personal. And I thought, my goodness, here I'm doing this virtual class tonight with you over Zoom. I don't know where you're located, but it doesn't matter. I want to share these ideas with you. But here was Myrtle Fillmore in 1926 doing the same thing and offering a virtual class by means of the radio, similar to Zoom, different technology, but it's the same idea going right into people's homes with the ideas that Myrtle loved, her love from the very first of unity, this idea that I am a child of God. Therefore, I do not inherit sickness. Sickness is not a part of my essential design. Yes, here on earth, we may encounter illness and difficulties, but it's not at the core truth of the master plan by which God created us in God's image and likeness. So Myrtle called her discovery, this process of healing and spiritual growth. And she said, if you will practice it, if you will try it, it will become your discovery. It'll become living within you. Not because Myrtle Fillmore said it, because you practiced it and experience it. Most material that we have from Myrtle is in, included in two books. Uh, probably the best known is How to Let God Help You, but also Myrtle Fillmore's Healing Letters. Both books are compilations of her letters. And I like to point this out because most of us know reading Charles Fillmore's books, many books, they're generally compilations of his Sunday lessons or maybe radio talks. And he was speaking to crowds. What we have from Myrtle Fillmore are the letters that she wrote to people who ask her for advice and support in the Unity Ideas. And so they were one-on-one -on -one letters, sometimes five or six pages long really in-depth instruction from Myrtle to one individual. That's how dedicated she was. And although they didn't keep records of her letters because they didn't feel that that was appropriate or confidential, they did keep letters in the last uh, three to five years of her life. And over the years, people donated back to Unity archives copies of letters they might have had. So they can kind of guesstimate that Myrtle, in her 40 years of uh, being a leader of unity, wrote somewhere between 15 and 20,000 individual letters, the way that she gave to the world, the way that she helped others. So now, let's move into her discovery, what she called her great love realizing that she was an expression of the infinite love, life, wisdom, power of God. And she could meet any challenge in her life, knowing this truth and faithfully holding to it. She believed like Emily Cady, who wrote Lessons in Truth, that the work is not ours. God does the work. Our job is to hold the faith, to faithfully believe in the presence and power of God, God as the omnipotent good in our life that we can trust, not just Tuesday, 
not just in October, but every day of every year of our life, and of course, beyond. The three steps as I interpret them, I hopefully will say that several times, the three steps as I interpret them from Myrtle's writings are one, two, three. One, identify the need. Identify the need. Perhaps you have a sense of a need of healing, of greater supply in your life, a need to be able to let go and forgive, a need for more harmonious relationships, a need for a greater sense of purpose. For Myrtle, her need was healing. She said the doctors had given her up, said she had about six uh, months to live before tuberculosis would take her life. She should get her affairs in order. And so her need, as she put it, was if I'm gonna stay on this planet, I need to be physically healed. So identifying that need in your heart. The second step, expand from the need to a greater awakening. We go to God for that specific need, but once we realize that, we say there's potential for great development in my life. It's not just the satisfaction of one need or prayer request, it's now to move on to all that you can be. And the third step, to move from that need that has been met, from expanding to your own greater spiritual development. The third step is, now I want to help others. Not tell them what to do, but share my story. Support them in their own awakening their own healing, whatever they need in their life, I can support that. And that was Myrtle's story. After her healing, and we know that she had the good fortune, we often make fun of mothers-in-law, but she had the good fortune that Charles' mother was a great caretaker and cared for the whole family so that Myrtle could spend two years in intense prayer and meditation work. She said, I let a prayer go up to Jesus Christ every hour. She went into this spiritual retreat because she wanted to be filled with this idea that she was God's child, created in God's image and likeness, spiritually perfect. And she knew if I could bring myself into alignment with that truth, my body would have to respond. And it did. If you look at the uh, history after Myrtle's healing in 1889, when Unity considers it began, something else began. Charles and Myrtle had their third son. So at the age of 45, healed from her weakened condition with tuberculosis, she gave birth to her third son. I think that's a strong indication that she regained her strength. Now, after that process, she began first helping the woman that cleaned the Fillmore home and then other neighbors and said, how can I support you in your illness or difficulty? I want to pray with you. I want to share what worked in my life. Maybe it'll be helpful to you. So Myrtle moved from that prayer need. She then began to realize, wow, there is a lot of potential in my being for development, growth. And then she wanted to help others. So she called that her discovery and let me just share a few of her own words. 
this is how I made what I call my discovery. I was thinking about life. Life is everywhere, in man and in worm. Then why does not the life in the worm make a body like man's? Then I thought, the worm has not as much sense as man. Ah, intelligence as well as life is needed to make a body. Here is the key to my study or to my discovery. Life has to be guided by intelligence in making all forms. The same law works in my own body. Life is simply a form of energy and has to be guided and directed in the body by intelligence. How do we communicate intelligence? By thinking and talking, of course. Then it flashed upon me that I might talk to the life centers in every part of my body. I began to teach my body and got marvelous results. As I said, she got results over time but she quit telling her body how sick it was, how weak it was. Oh, woe is me. And she started praising the presence of life, the presence of God in her own body, praising the organs in the system, praising her eyes, saying these are youthful eyes with clear, powerful vision, rather than saying, oh, I just don't see well anymore. She lifted herself up. Now, perhaps we can consider what unity is today, what our own experience is, and we might learn by looking back to how it began, which is the intention of my evening with you. Charles and Myrtle Fillmore, the founders, sometimes describe unity in an almost fanatical style. Yes, they were enthusiastic. Here I want to share with you an excerpt from the first issue of Unity Magazine in June of 1891. It describes, if you read between the lines, to not beg God for healing. For me, God, please. Please bring me my health. Please heal this situation. Instead, they learn to realize their true nature as God's creation. So here's what they wrote. I enjoy it. It's a little bit amusing in a way, but please hear between the lines the point they're trying to make. A very little common sense reason will show you that you are sustained body and soul by that invisible cause which ever wells up in you and will always manifest itself as the silent builder when you heed its monition. Be still and know that I am God. It is within you and without you in a pulsating sea of life and intelligence simply awaiting your recognition of its presence. Do not let the shallow reasoning of your companions or friends who float about in the thin scum of effects deter you for an instant from looking to the omnipotent cause for your strength in all the affairs of life. This world is full of silly creatures who float about for a time in a maze of materiality, only to go out in the end like snowflakes. We say to you that first cause is an intelligent, all-powerful principle of light and life, which will demonstrate to you personally, as it has to us, if you will bring yourself mentally into proper relations with it. Let your thoughts dwell upon God's love and power, but for 15 minutes each day, and you shall find a blessing is being poured out upon you such as you never dreamed 
possible. Unity was a new thought within the Christian tradition. It, like some other organizations similar to it in new thought, they came down to us in history, such as religious science, divine science, homes of truth, and others. But we're considering our unity tradition. And it shifted the focus in religion from morality to science. Achieving health was not a moral question where you approach God and say, if you will heal me, I'll do better. I'll be kinder. I'll be more generous. I'll quit wicked ways. No, it was about knowledge now. What many of those organizations called spiritual science. It was about the knowledge of God designed human beings. What are we as spiritual human beings or creations of the infinite? What are we? If we can catch that thought and hold it faithfully, it will establish itself in our consciousness that is our thinking and also our feeling nature and our body. And we'll begin to come, as the Fillmore's called it, into right relation with the infinite with life. As we strive to understand, we learn of our divine inheritance. As the book of creation, Genesis states, we are created in the image and likeness of God. Unity, of course, beginning with the Fillmore's, unity takes that very seriously, very faithfully, or in the words of Paul, a favorite mystic of Charles Fillmore, he felt a close affinity with Paul. Paul wrote, we are children of God. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ. So even Paul captured that idea the idea that if we are God's creation, then we must have divine qualities, powers, what the film was called a spiritual inheritance. It must be within the very spiritual DNA of all that we are. So let's return to Myrtle's three steps of development. The need, our overall development, and third, helping others. It's not all about me. It's how am I a beneficial presence in this world in which I live. If I expect abundant blessing by my God from the very core of my being, isn't it something I should support and foster in others? my brothers and sisters, for we're all children of God. Now the unity movement, if we look at it closely, I believe it actually mimicked, or maybe that's not the right word. It, I can't think of the word I want. It experienced in an expanded way, these same three steps of Myrtle Fillmore's healing. And by that, I mean, in the first years of unity, there were the tremendous interest in physical healing. People were coming to unity for prayer support and guidance in their own physical healing. Charles Fillmore often, was, often um, referred to the fact that in the Christianity that developed after the lifetime of Jesus, the emphasis was on the power of spirit to heal, physically heal. Think of the many stories in the gospels about Jesus and healing. And have you noticed? He didn't give credit to himself for these miraculous healings. 
he always said, sister, your faith has healed you. Or to another, your faith has made you whole. So he was calling their attention, Jesus that is, that their healing was a result in their faith in life, their faith in their God, just like Myrtle Fillmore. So we had that need in the very beginning of our unity movement, a need for physical healing. Then as Myrtle experienced, as what I call the second step, she realized it was more than just her physical healing. It was about awakening what she called all the departments of her being. That is all the aspects of her body and soul, her mind, her heart. We might say her thinking nature, her feeling nature, and her willing nature. That is what gives us the focus to carry out actions based on our inner thoughts and feelings. And so the movement, just like Myrtle, began to shift in the early 20th century toward this idea of developing more fully our spiritual inheritance, developing the potential of all that we are as God's creation. So what happened? Charles developed what eventually was published in 1930 as the 12 powers. This development of these 12 ideal powers within us. In 1939, he brought forth the book, Jesus Christ Heals, a few years later, he wrote with his second wife, Cora Fillmore, teach us to pray. So there was this expansion from physical healing to really the entire nature of the individual. And like Myrtle Fillmore, reached out to help her neighbors. How can I help? How can I pray with you? How can I celebrate and nurture your development. Unity did the same thing. I'm not saying that they didn't have charitable interests in the beginning, but there was a greater sense in the unity movement of outreach and what nowadays we call social, social justice, social concerns. And unity became more interested in that reaching out and helping others. One, through its great publishing work, it began publishing uh, periodicals to help men and women who were in business, different age groups, from the old We Wisdom magazine to a magazine for adolescents and young people. And so they tried to communicate these ideas, but they also reached out in other ways. Unity Village in the 1960s, uh, eventually uh, with the Association of Unity Churches, developed a counseling and healing center to work with people who were not necessarily Unity students specifically, but they were welcome to come in and experience Unity's method of practical Christianity. Christianity that met more than religious or spiritual needs, but met the needs of our entire life in relationships, mental health, physical health. And at times, uh, they've also ventured into uh, cultural uh, aspects, um, uh, stimulating those with artistic nature, those with musical gifts, and encouraging people in a number of ways. So what is unity today? At our recent virtual conference in June of unity centers throughout the world, sponsored by Unity Worldwide Ministries, there was certainly talk about how do we grow hybrid churches, just like tonight when we're together by Zoom, but also can be together in person how do we develop that technology further? The earth care program, how do we reach out to the world and say, 
if we believe in the goodness of life, shouldn't we help people in the care of nature, the care of our planet? And of course, the social justice concerns of our world in recent years around the old struggle of racism, the greater struggle of separating people into us and them. How can unity help in this social work, in this world work of relationships and connecting? So here, Myrtle launched through her own life her three steps. God, I know you're with me. I know if I keep my attention fixed on that truth, you will help me through this physical challenge or other challenges in my life. When that need has been met, we realize, wow, my life could be so much fuller, more complete, if I give it my attention and recognize that God's in every aspect of my life. There was a unity minister in New York years ago. He got tremendous turnout at Carnegie Hall because he put out the word, God is your wealth. Oh, man, people were really upset. Connecting God with something as dirty as our money? But of course we know God is our source of all good and expresses through our financial life as well. So unity today, just like Myrtle is reaching out, how? How can we be of more help to people in every, what Myrtle called, every department of their being? that their life might be full and complete. So I have talked a lot. So I want to take this opportunity first to guide you through some questions. So get your paper ready and we'll have a few moments of silence so that we can think around this. And then we will take these ideas that we have each experienced in our own way, take them into a time of meditation and then, as Barbara said, when we uh, stop recording, because we do have uh, matters of confidentiality, you'll have the opportunity to uh, use the chat system to uh, present questions, uh, what we might discover in um, one another's story. So first, let's just take a moment to center ourselves. Close your eyes if you choose or soften your gaze and just allow your awareness to go within. You may focus on the beautiful rhythm of your breathing or the pulse of your heart. Isn't it amazing to stop and be still and to become aware of that pulse of the heart and of your respiratory system. It's such a beautiful expression of faith. It doesn't work on one day and take another day off. This pulse of life within us is constant and sure. And though at times it may become out of line due to some disturbance in our system, it does eventually re regulate itself back into this be beautiful pulse, a rhythm. And whenever we become still and become aware of this, what the Fillmore's called this pulsing sea of life within us and all around us, we begin to settle into an awareness that, that the creator of all life, all good, is also 
within every cell and system of our body. Within every thought and feeling of our soul. Within the will that allows us to take action, to fulfill deeds in our life. God, we recognize you are present as the pulse of life in every aspect, in every department of our being. So let me po pose this question to you, and then I'll give you a little time to think about it. And then just jot down a few words. What? is your need. Perhaps healing, forgiveness, supply, greater love in your relationships. What is your need? Take a few moments. Take some notes. Just focus. What do I need now? What am I asking of life? As you make a few notes, I'll share a little method that a great unity teacher shared with me years ago. The fewer words you use, the more focused is your thought. So it doesn't take a lot of words. And if you know me, that's a big statement. It doesn't take a lot of words. Okay, let's move to the second question. How would you feel? What would you experience if this need that you're just focused on is met? greater well-being in your physical body? How would it feel if that was met tonight, tomorrow? Or like Myrtle's experience after two years of focusing on that prayer request. However long it takes, what would be your experience as life meets that need for you. Now, the second part of this question is, how could the meeting of that need, your greater health, your greater supply, your greater love in your life. How could the meeting of that need increase your self-awareness and spiritual growth? Remember, this was Myrtle's discovery. She wanted it to be your discovery. This big struggle in your life has been eased, healed. Are you going to stop there? Are you going to say, ooh, 
there's potential for healing, not just this request of mine, but healing me, developing me in every aspect. Your body, heart, mind. Perhaps you've chanted that well-known chant. Heal what needs to be healed, then reveal what needs to be revealed. I love that chant. The healing of one need is just opening a door to greater healing in diverse ways in your entire life. So how would your self-awareness expand? How would your spiritual growth develop? And of course, later, it's my hope that you will work with these three questions more extensively. We only have an hour tonight. So I'm gonna move on to step three. What would you want to give, share, do in your community or the greater world? What would you want to contribute to the common good because your life has been healed, made more complete, nourished and expanded? Wouldn't you want to share that with others? The Gospels contain several stories that Jesus told about the shepherd who found the lost lamb, the woman who lost a coin in her home, and then found it. And a lot of these stories say, then all the neighbors came and they all celebrated and rejoiced. You found your health, your greater good. Don't you wanna celebrate it with others? Don't you want to see others prosper in a similar way with greater healing, supply and well being in their life? So what could you offer the common good from your increased joy, well-being, love in your life? Okay, let's plant these seed thoughts, as Myrtle called them, in a time of silent, Meditation. She said, remember your faith. These thoughts, these spiritual principles, if you want, are like seeds. You plant them in mind. You trust in their power. Don't you trust a seed properly planted? It will germinate, grow, develop and bring forth its flower and fruit. So think of these seed thoughts. You plant them, you consistently maintain them in your life, but as you focus on them, you repeat them, you hold them in prayer, and you act in ways that demonstrate that truth. That was another favorite of the film ones demonstrate the truth, you know, like a scientist. If I believe such and such, then I am going to act in ways that promote that truth. Charles said, you want greater prosperity in your life? Then do the things that make for prosperity, that support it through the actions you take, the choices you take generosity that you show others. So let's take a moment 
again, closing our eyes, as we plant these principles, this spiritual inheritance, the truth of our being, we can be confident that these thought seeds will germinate, take root and bring forth their gifts, their harvest. So our first step, we faithfully hold to the knowledge of our origin. Myrtle said, I'm a child of God. She recognized her origin. Our foundation for confidence in living. Jesus quoted the Psalms when he said, Know you not? You are gods, sons and daughters of the Most High. Don't take this lightly, take it seriously your origin, you have come forth from the infinite. Now we hold the principle or emphasis of that second step, the enlightenment and self-awareness that we know when we realize we are not yet all we will be. We might say we're a work in progress. We affirm a potential for development and that potential is unlimited. Again, Jesus gave us that clue by saying what I do, you will do also and even greater things. So really holding to this truth, planting the seed thought, I'm not yet all I will one day be. I am in the process of infinite development. Our third step, the foundation of it, is the realization that the same spirit Within me is within all people. This law of Christ awareness sets the standards for all relationships and community. Love your neighbor. Love your neighbor. Not equally to yourself, but love your neighbor as a true part of yourself. Love your neighbor as a true part of yourself. In the absolute truth, there is no separation of the infinite life of the God presence. In the absolute truth, there is not even distinction between God's people. Isn't this a way that we understand unity? Not that we just love hugging and holding hands. It's to realize it to the very core. The same life animates us all, as Paul said. So part of the development is this third step. What do I bring to the common good? How do I love my neighbor, not equally, but love my neighbor as a true part of my self when I understand there is no separation in God's truth? So let's conclude this seed planting in mind. 
as we develop, things always transform and develop further. So at the beginning of the class, I gave you this idea of Myrtle's three steps. Identify the need. What am I seeking? When it's fulfilled, realizing that there's more to know, more to be, more to develop within myself. And then the third step, how can I share this joy with others? How can I support this truth in the lives of others? Well, I believe we can, as the great chef Emeril Lagasse says, kick it up a notch, kick it up a notch. So now I'm saying, let's make these three steps, transpose them into a higher power. Now step one is gift. Recognizing the gift of divine life in you. Step two, recognizing potential or insight into your life. There's unlimited possibility within me because I am a child of the infinite. And then the third, offering, offering. How do I intend to be a beneficial presence in the world? If I believe in infinite goodness within myself, then I logically know that infinite good in others. And I wanna support it in my community, in my church, in my family, in my world. Number one, recognize that gift. Two, recognize the unlimited potential within. And three, my offering to the world is to know that same truth in others and to support it with as much passion as I support it in my own life. I'll conclude with a quote I love from Lessons in Truth, Emily Cady. She says, oh, beloved, it's all the same truth. And you and I, there may be distinctions, but ultimately there is no difference. Isn't that a wonderful phrase? There may be distinctions, there may be diversity among us in the world, but in truth, there is no difference. Not if we know, not if we faithfully claim, I am a child of God, you are a child of the infinite. We all are. Myrtle started Unity with her personal realization. She built it through 40 years of dedication into our worldwide movement. How far will it go? What will be next? She made her discovery. Are you making your discovery? Are we all discovering the power within? Thank you for allowing me to tell these historical stories, but hopefully you realize how they are still resonant, valid today. Still today, and they will be tomorrow because logically they're eternal truth. Cultures will shape them differently over time, but that truth rings and resonates through life, your life and mine. So thank you for sharing this time with me. And as we stop the recording, if you have questions, comments you want to share, contributions, that's the gift you give to me, sharing your insight as well.
and I have one live, two live human beings here in the room. So. <laughs> They're sharing. Sand. Just don't stop. See where our stop on our recording is. Oh, there it is. <laughs>